Hello and welcome. And I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. This is a session of the Science Festival that links Orkney with developments worldwide. The story started last year in The Economist magazine. It reported research in New Zealand that showed that seaweed in the diet is good for farm animals and good for the environment. It's good for the animals because it helps them put on weight. They put on weight by absorbing some of the methane gas that otherwise would be deposited in the atmosphere and adding to the problems of greenhouses, greenhouse gases and global warming. Well, today we're going to hear from three researchers who are looking into the potential for this. But the story has a direct Orkney link because in North Ronaldsea, the sheep on the shore have been doing what the researchers say is good for them and the environment for the past 5,000 years. And we're going to start by going direct to North Ronaldsea to welcome Sean Tarrant, who's the sheep dike warden. Hello, Sean. Welcome to the programme. Hi, Howie. We're delighted that you're able to join us and present some information about the sheep. I'd like to ask you first just a word or two about your background in marine biology. Yeah, I studied marine biology at uh, St Andrews, uh, graduating uh, seven years ago now. <laughs> Feels and a lot more recently than that, but um, yeah, I did marine biology and I worked with seals for a few years before moving to North Ronaldsea in November last year. And you're used to the vicissitudes of the, the climate, harsh mm -hmm. temperatures in, in some of the previous work you've done. Yeah, I was in the sub-Antarctic um, for a year and a half, so I'm used to the wind and the rain and the cold. Well, we're going to look forward to seeing what you've got to tell us about the, the seaweed-eating sheep on the shore of North Ronaldsea. Okay, so as Howie mentioned, I'm the sheep dike warden on North Ronaldsea. Um, so I moved here last November to take up the role, uh, which focuses on rebuilding the sheep dike. Um, so it's about 12 miles long and it encircles the island. Um, and because of winter storms, about a quarter of it needs repairing or rebuilding. Uh, next slide, please. So the North Ronaldsea sheep are a small rare breed of Northern short-tailed group. So they're only about 25 kilos, they're really small sheep, and they're famous for their diet of seaweed. Bones from really similar looking uh, sheep, which also ate seaweed, have been found on other sites around Orkney, which were over 5,000 years old, suggesting that this breed was once widespread over all of the Orkney Islands. Next slide, please. As the land was turned over to crops, Cattle and bigger breeds of sheep in the 1800s, North Ronaldsea's landscape provided a unique opportunity to confine the native sheep to the beaches. So the circumference of the island is about 13 miles and it's really flat, which allowed the construction of a dry stone wall around it. And so the native sheep were restricted to a diet mainly consisting of seaweed, allowing this prehistoric breed to be saved and, survived in, and, to, and to survive into the 21st century to help fight climate change. So due to the storm damage in recent years, about a quarter of the wall is damaged and needs to be repaired or rebuilt. In the past, that would have been done by the islanders. So in the, eight, in the 1800s, there were about 500 islanders, but now there are only about 60 and the majority of them are elderly. So this is where I come in, the sheep dike warden, to repair the wall and allow the sheep to remain on the beaches. So the sheep are famous for their seaweed uh, eating diet, which is very unusual in... Um, in land mammals, so the only other species which lives on land and consumes a lot of seaweed is the marine um, iguana, which lives in the Galapagos. Um, so, but I'm going to talk a little more about their use uh, for clearing terrestrial plants and not just eating seaweed. Uh, next slide, please. So the term conservation grazing is using livestock such as sheep, such as sheep or cows to restore or ma maintain biodiverse habitats. Livestock are a more sustainable alternative to the fossil fuel driven machines commonly used today to clear vegetation. Conservation grazers remove plant material through browsing, including coarse vegetation, which can outcompete wildflowers. Um, in, this, in the picture here, we've got two North Ronaldsea lambs and they're actually eating 
um, a perennial set of thistle and uh, yeah they, they were in this pen um, for a couple of weeks and they completely cleared all the thistle in there. So one method that you can use to um, clear coarse vegetation is called mob grazing. So this is when you have short duration and high, di high density in a given area. So you'd have a small um, fenced off pen with a few sheep on it and you'd move them every couple of days or so so they can really eat the ground, eat the vegetation down to the ground level. So mob grazing results in landscape mosaicness. The vegetation in a given area is of varying heights. So you've got tall and short patches of vegetation that can support a greater diversity of insects than would be possible if all the vegetation was of a similar height and structure. So as the sheep browse and trample the vegetation, they open up the sward at ground level, which provides a range of microclimates and habitats for a wider range of invertebrates. The hooves also disturb the ground. This opens up the seed bank in the soil and the poaching, which is where the hooves enter the soil, is useful for putting organic matter back into the soil and create a space for the, the new plants from the, from the seed bank populations uh, to find somewhere to grow. So conservation grazers also enrich their, the soil through their dung, which has its own characteristic, characteristic fauna of dung beetles and dung flies. These primitive breeds, such as North Ronaldsley sheep, are ideal in conservation grazing because they're small and light, so they don't compact the ground heavily, and they're very hardy animals and so require minimal management. Um, next slide, please. So the map we see here was taken from the Habitat Map of Scotland produced by Scottish Na Natural Heritage, and it uh, shows areas of Macca throughout Orkney. So North Ronaldsley is right at the top, um, and you can see like much of it um, is suitable for growing maca. So it provides the rare conditions needed for uh, this habitat. The word maca comes from Gaelic, which means fertile, low-lying grassy plain, and it's only found in the coast, on the coast in North and West Scotland and in Western Ireland. It, it occurs nowhere else in the world. Maca habitat is a blend of low-lying coastline sand partly consisting of shell fragments, the effect of strong winds, just the right amount of rainfall and the involvement of people and their grazing animals. Macca habitats are important for many plant, bird and invertebrate species and in particular the great yellow bumblebee which you can see on the flower on the slide. So the great yellow bumblebee is one of the rarest bumblebee species native to the UK and they're in decline due to the loss of flower rich habitats. Orkney is one remaining stronghold for the yellow, great yellow bumblebee with sightings as far north as Pappy and Sandy in recent years. Restoration of the Maca habitat on North Ronaldsey could increase Orkney's population of great yellow bumblebees. So grazing is a really important part of Maca management. So you want to strip the vegetation in the winter so that in the spring, the wildflowers can come through and they're not outcompeted by other coarser vegetation. So those areas would be stock free in the summer, so they'd have the best flowers for the great yellow bumblebees. A project in the northwest of North Ronaldsey will use these indigenous sheep to restore the maca habitat with a view to encourage great yellow bumblebees onto the island. Thanks for listening and I'll pass over to my colleague Katerina. Well, welcome, Katerina. Just before you start, indeed, I'd just like to ask you about your background. I know you're an Associate Professor in Farm Animal Nutrition at Queen's University, Belfast. That's your background, animal nutrition and alternative diets in some cases. Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Yes, initially my degree is animal production, and then I continue and I uh, study further on animal nutrition, and I'm interested in alternative feeds, yes. And you've looked at, am I right in thinking you've looked at some unusual alternative feed possibilities? Yeah, um, in, in uh, my research we, group, we work both with ruminants and monogastric, and at that time we have a project working with insects, actually, uh, for pigs and broilers. So this is quite interesting and novel. And this then is the, the pattern that's led to your interest in seaweed, and I'll hand over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, just to start with the big picture, to, to explain a few things. So, and nowadays, uh, agriculture faces many challenges uh, that we need to find solutions 
Uh, so all we know that population is going to be increased and reached like uh, uh, 9.7 billion by 2050. And it's predicted by 2100, it will be like 11 billion. So there is a global demand for milk and meat. And for that reason, we need to produce more. However, at the same time, we need to keep the same high quality for these animal products. Also, uh, nowadays, there is some environmental concerns that mainly related to the greenhouse gas emissions and ammonia emissions by ruminants. For that reasons, we need to find solutions and alternative ways to produce more sustainably. Next slide, please. So as you can see in this uh, slide, um, almost 70% of world uh, is water and approximately one third of land mass is suitable as agricultural um, uh, land. Next slide, please. Also uh, a great uh, concern nowadays is that 80% uh, of feed protein is imported from outside European Union. Uh, an example for that is soya. So soya, if we consider that it's like the golden standard or the king of the protein, uh, source in the diets of the animal. Um, uh, there are although some concerns. So soya in sim is imported from far away. We are not always sure about the quality of this feed. And also there is some social concern about uh, GMO exist uh, in that kind of feeds. On the other hand, if we think about the environment, uh, we know that about 71% of uh, South American rainforest is converted to uh, land using for farming. So immediately we have a loss of uh, biodiversity. Next slide, please. So um, as mentioned before, there is a great concern nowadays about the greenhouse um, emissions produced by the ruminants and also the ammonia emissions. And that is the reason um, we need to start find and investigate alternative feeds for the animal. So these feeds must uh, have some specific characteristics based on the challenges that agriculture face nowadays. Um, next slide, please. And this is where seaweed is coming. Um, seaweed, otherwise called macroalgae, um, uh, has different categories. So we can find the red algae, the green algae, and the brown one. Next, next slide, please. So why seaweed actually? Why this is a feed that we investigate more, especially last year? So actually seaweed is not a new concept. Uh, so even from the ancient years, like in Greece or the uh, Iceland, for example, uh, the farmers, they used to let the animals grazing in the beach. And the reason is they, they've uh, eaten uh, seaweed and in, this, in that way, they consume the necessary minerals they need to have in their diets. So, so actually seaweed is going to be a, a great alternative feed because it matches the characteristic that we discussed before. First of all, uh, it does not compete with the land and the crop that we would like and we have to use for the production of crops that later on uh, will be used for the human consumption. Also, it has a great mineral profile, a great amino acid profile that meet the needs of the animal. Uh, but also the most important thing is that it has the potential to reduce the methane and ammonia emissions by the ruminants. And let's see how that can be uh, possible. Next slide, please. So uh, as I told you earlier, we have the red, the green and the brown seaweed. So um, uh, let's start with the brown one. Um, nowadays, there are a lot of research around the brown seaweed. And why, why is this happening? This is happening because uh, the brown seaweed, they, call, they contain a, a bioactive compound called uh, fluorotannin. And with, what is the interesting thing with that? Fluorotannin is able to, uh, to reduce the methane, but also the ammonia emissions by the ruminants. So let's start with the ammonia emissions. When we feed 
the animal uh, a feed, then this feed is going to the rumen. Protein is degraded, is broken down, let's say, in uh, amino acids, and then we have the ammonia that's produced. This ammonia can be found later in the feces or the urine of the animal. And um, there are two issues about that. First of all, environmentally can cause pollution because this can be leaching through the water or through, or through the soil. But also the higher the amount of ammonia, the less, the less the protein that absorbed by the animal and can be utilized for further uh, uh, functions. So what, what is Florotan and what is she doing? So when we feed seaweed to the animals, then fluorotannin has the ability to protect protein from degradation. So protein is protected in the rumen by making a complex with protein. And for that reason, less ammonia is produced and more protein is absorbed from the animal um, uh, for different functions. On the other hand, fluorotannin, as I told earlier, is able to reduce the methane emissions uh, by the animal. And how this happened, uh, there are different mechanisms, but the most uh, famous, the most uh, accepted is it's able to reduce uh, the methanogenic bacteria in the rumen. So we have a change of microbiota and reduce of uh, bacteria which are responsible for the production of methane. So these are the very great things with brown seaweed, but let's see what is happening with the red ones. Um, as you can see below, um, red seaweed has a great representative called uh, asparagopsis. So asparagopsis is a red seaweed that contains a bromophore. Bromophore is a bioactive compound that um, is actually the most abutant compound that found is in this um, uh, red seaweed and has been shown to reduce the, me the methane uh, emissions. Uh, the mechanism behind that is slightly different than fluorotannin, and if promophore can is able to inhibit some enzymatic activities that happen in the rumen by binding vitamin 12, which is related with another enzyme responsible for methanogenesis. So as you can see, by introducing uh, seaweed in the diet of the animals, uh, there is a great potential to reduce not only the methane, uh, but also the ammonia emissions by the ruminants, and with that way to reduce the environmental pollution, but also improve the animal performance. So next slide, please. So in this slide, I will give you just um, a small example um, of the work that we are doing in our lab. So um, we participate in different projects and we try to investigate uh, and screen in vitro different species of seaweed that have a great potential on that direction. And then we carry out our in vivo trials to investigate um, with real animals, the reduction of methane and the effect uh, on animal performance. So in this uh, graph, what we did, as you can see, we compare different species of seaweed with Luzerne. And the Luzerne, uh, the great uh, thing with Luzerne is that it has no fluorotannins. And in that case, you can see the green light, which represent the production of methane emissions, how high is for Luzerne and how low is with the seaweed that contain uh, the fluorotannins. So this is just preliminary data and we are very happy to start our in vivo trial uh, uh, with that. So thank you very much. Uh, for, uh, for listening. And now I will pass to my colleague, Luisa, for uh, her talk. We we'll look forward to just, in fact, before um, Luisa comes in, can I just introduce her background, Luisa, University of Nottingham? Yes, University of Nottingham. And it's chemistry, in fact, your background? Uh, my background started as medicinal chemistry, and then over the years I've moved more and more towards uh, inorganic and biological chemistry, and now I'm in Nottingham doing, yes, bioinorganic chemistry. Well, we're looking forward to hearing, what, hearing your interest. Thank you. Right, good afternoon, everyone. 
And before I start talking about seaweed, uh, I will just give you a brief introduction about uh, uh, renewable uh, sources of energy. And as you all probably know, it's an imperative for modern society to find alternatives to fossil fuel that are renewable and, and they're sustainable. Polysaccharides uh, that are very well spread and there are a huge uh, amount of energy stored in them in the, in the forms of long chains of sugar. Like for example, I've put on the slide the structure of a cellulose. What we want to do is to take waste material, so not food, but leaves, straw, things that are going to go and be discarded, break them down effectively into the sugars that, comp that um, make them and then ferment this sugar to have a source of bioethanol or modify them to give the starting blocks for uh, commodity chemicals. This is very difficult though and as you can see in the structure of the cellulose for example you have all these bonds that interconnect the various sugars and then make the breakdown of these uh, natural polymers very very difficult. Uh, in the next slide uh, you will see these are fossils uh, that are as old as 40 million years, and there you can still find intact polysaccharides. Um, they, they are really hard to break unless they are exposed to elements. So you will wonder why are we not completely submerged by cellulose and other materials if they are so strong? Well, in the next slide you will see an image that probably you're familiar with. If you go for a walk in the woods or something, you will see something like this. Bacteria and fungi that will attack these polysaccharides and will degrade them. And this organism will, will gain energy from them. And this is what we want to do. This is how we want to learn and use the same mechanisms. So how do they do it? And in the next slide, there is a very, uh, simple scheme of how these organisms do it. They secrete a wide range of enzymes, different proteins that will attack the polysaccharides from different angles. Uh, and all these enzymes, they all have different roles and they all work together. And there is still so much that we don't understand uh, about uh, the interplay of the different enzymes. In the blue circle in the, in the slide, there is a particular enzyme that is called lytic polysaccharide monoxygenases. And they were discovered only 10 years ago and they've completely revolutionized the field at the point that they're now included in all industrial enzymatic cocktails uh, that industry produces. And they are making the production of uh, biofuel from waste material uh, economically viable, real, viable reality. And these are the enzymes I've been working on for the past five years or so. So in the next slide, you will see uh, a general structure of one of these enzymes. The orange sphere uh, is a copper ion, and that's where the magic, where the chemistry happens. Uh, and they break down the cellulose very effectively. And the reason why they got so popular and so important for industry uh, is kind of synthesizing the scheme that you will see in the right hand side. So you will see this LPMO by itself doesn't release any sugar. If then you have uh, an enzyme that is called GH6, uh, those are the standard enzymes that have been known for decades and they are very good at breaking down cellulose, but you will see the GH6 by itself doesn't really release a lot of sugar. And that's why so far the process has been difficult to develop. But when then you combine them together, and if you look at the last bar on the, on the right, you see a massive increase uh, up to 100 fold um, of the release of sugar, which means that you can really optimize uh, the enzymatic cocktail that the industry uses and then make the process viable. So this is the current state uh, of using of biomass for uh, energy production. But in the next slide, please, that's going back a little bit to what Katerina was saying. Cellulose requires, even if it's waste material, so no food, 
it will still require arable land and fresh water, and uh, it can cause competition for crops if we are using the land and the water to, to grow something else, then it's water and land that we're taking off from, uh, maybe uh, arable land to, to, for crops or for animal feed. If we can shift from cellulose into using seaweed to do exactly the same process, then we might be much better off. So seaweed is among the fastest growing organism on the planet does not require fresh water or land. And on top of all the advantages for animal feed that Katerina has told us about, it will also give us advantage in terms of producing energy in a way that is sustainable, viable, and doesn't affect production of, of other things. So in the, last, in the next slide, which is also my last slide, we go into wondering what can we learn from the sheep that live on the shore? Um, they uh, live exclusively on seaweed, which means that they are very good at, a, at taking energy from the seaweed in order to um, have all their biological function. So the question that we would ask, what enzymes do they use and what can we learn from the sheep as scientists to then utilize the same mechanism for seaweed degradation instead of cellulose degradation. And on that, I will stop and I will pass on to Jessica and Howie again. Well, that's most interesting. And Jessica takes up the story from Aberystwyth, where she works in bioconversion and biorefining. And does that mean, Jessica, that you're interested in the very much the nuts and bolts of the process to find the enzymes that are doing the work so that you can apply them to other things? Yes, there's a lot of that. Um, yes, no, these sheep are, are fascinating. Um, I mean, the fact that they're able to break down seaweed and grow and thrive on it is is really quite unique um so. well over to you okay thank you um so oh sorry could you go back a slide please oh okay we've sorry don't worry um so my first slide um was some happy looking north run say sheep i suppose like the picture the ones that you can see in this picture here um and i just wanted to say about them um that um i first heard about these sheep um, back in 2008 um, and, and I went up to North Ronsa in, in April of 2008. Could you move to the next slide please? Um, when I got up there the, sh the sheep didn't look in the in the nice sunny picture like like in that picture and in all Shan pictures they were more more like this um, so you can see that the tide's coming in um, there's a bit of drizzle there's a bit of wind so they're all sort of sheltered against the walls um, so to me, I mean, this was just sort of showing me what a sort of striking, um, con what conditions they have to live in, that, um, that they're able to grow and thrive in, in really quite adverse conditions here. Um, so the reason I, I came up to North Ronald say, um, having heard about these sheep, um, was through um, Dr. June Morris, who lives on North Ronald say, who um, was my sort of initial connection with the sheep. Um, and she um, enabled me to, to come up and to take some samples. So I, I just started um, doing a, a work after my PhD looking at making biofuels from seaweeds. And somebody said, well, have you heard about these sheep? Because um, they must have some very interesting new enzymes within their rumen, within their stomachs, which are able to break down the seaweed. So you could find some really interesting things there. So that's that's what what, what got me to come to, to North Rome, say in the first place. Um, next slide, please. So when I, when I came up, um, what I did is I went to four locations around the island with, with June's help. So um, we went to the sort of West Ness at the top and Strom Ness at the bottom um, and the Bird Observatory. Um, and then Hower, which is um, was grassland where the sheep were being kept on grass. And at each location, I'd go there and generally the sheep would, would run away. Um, but as they as they ran, then um, some of them had had poos while they were leaving, um, and it's much easier to get um, a representative sample of the rumen from fecal material than getting it from the rumen because you can't you can't easily do that without really traumatizing the sheep nowadays. Um, 
So I was, I was going to these locations, I was taking fecal samples from each of them, um, and I was putting them into um, these liquid media. So this is a way of preserving the microbes that are in there. Um, and I had different ones to hopefully preserve different types with the idea that I can then take them back to Aberystwyth and, and do some work on them. So when I, when I got back, what I was doing is taking a little bit of each of these liquids um, and then putting them into new bottles with um, a whole lot of different micro, um, sort of nutrients for the, for the bacteria um, in there um, and, and, and hoping that some of them would, would grow and, and keep growing. Um, and I sort of did this, what we call subculturing a couple of times, um, mostly because um, one of the media I, I came back with was full of little bits of charcoal. So if you wanna see if some bacteria is growing, then if the liquid's cloudy, then you know you've got growth. But if you, you, the liquid is just black, that you can't really tell. Um, so I did this and after a while, I felt that I did have some good cultures which were existing there. Um, and after that, um, I took out the DNA from them, I extracted the DNA uh, and I had it sequenced. Um, and then I compared my little bits of DNA with DNA on a database, which you can get to online, and it will identify for you what these, um, what the species is that the, the DNA came from. So in this way, I managed to get um, over 80 identifications of different bacterial species that were in there. Um, so it was yeah, a really nice study. Um, but next slide, please. My results. Um, were this, that there really wasn't actually anything stand out amazing in there, which is a shame, but this is science. Um, the bacteria and species that I did find were generally the same or they were similar to other studies, but it, it kind of gave me an introduction to the sheep and it, I could see that there was a lot of potential here. Um, so I wanted to carry on in this area. So next slide, please. Um, so what I managed to do is, although I haven't actually managed to do any more North Ronde work myself, um, I managed to get a PhD student um, a couple of years later who was working on sort of processing marine biomass, which was basically seaweed. Um, and I managed to get a bit of North Ronde um, work in there. And then later on, I had a postdoc who was looking for new enzymes for breaking down seaweed. Um, in particular, she was looking at breaking down the green algae um, called Ulva. Um, and again, I managed to get a, a little bit of North Ronde in there. And I'm just going to talk about these projects a little bit more in the next couple of slides. So next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, this was a um, PhD student. Um, and so she did a lot of work on um, sort of snails and, and limpets. Um, but she did get a bit of North Ronde material as well. And for each of them, she did sort of similar work to um, to that which I was, I was sort of going to be doing. So you would um, take, take isolates um, and grow up, um, identify the isolates and get them growing. And then you'd put them into something called a deep well plate. Now the picture in the bottom right hand corner is sort of a similar layout to one of these plates. So each of the wells, you can put um, a microbe in there um, that you've isolated. Um, and then you can get um, a thing that looks, a, a, I call it a spotter. Um, so you think of it like a really, like a big flat hairbrush and each bristle goes into one of those holes um, and you put it in and then you can take it out and you can sort of dab it onto things and you can spot onto other agar plates um, your, your colonies. So that's what's happening on the on the bottom left hand side um, and you can see here that those of those isolates that have uh, those microbes have been isolated. Some of them have grown, some have not grown at all um, and some of them have got sort of what we're calling clearing patches. So they're a diff different color round the colony. And what's happening there is that those microbes are sending out enzymes into the, the media, uh, which are breaking things down. So by doing these initial screens, we were able to select um, certain um, isolates and then we're able to use them in secondary studies. Um, so the picture on the bottom um, right is actually showing Hopefully you can see that some of those um, wells on the plate have got a little bit more blue than others. So that is showing um, that there is an enzyme there called laminarinase and laminarinase breaks down laminarin, which is the main polysaccharide in your brown seaweeds. Um, 
So it was, it's a way of actually sort of looking at these enzymes and, and, and seeing that they're actually doing what we, we want them to do. Next slide, please. Um, so with the postdoc, what we were doing is um, create, uh, looking for new enzymes in a different route. So this is called a metagenomic library. Now, when you go up and you take material um, and you put it into culture and you take out isolates, you only culture about 10% of the micro species that are there. Um, this is partly because um, some of them just don't seem to want to grow in culture. Um, if you grow it with or without oxygen, um, then you're automatically selecting for or against certain groups there. You might be selecting particularly for bacteria over fungi and so on. Um, but what we did in this study is we took out DNA from all the microbes that are there. We didn't mind if they were alive or dead, whether they would grow or not. We just took out all the DNA and we chopped it up into little pieces. Um, and then if you look on the right hand side, you've got these things that look a bit like horseshoes. Um, <clears throat> so these are called vectors. And what we can do is we can put those little bits of DNA into these horseshoes to make them into circles. Um, um, and we call this a vector. Um, and the, we, we can put these vectors into a host. Um, and the host in this case is E. coli, which is in the bottom left. Um, so we use E. coli. E. coli is a bacteria that we know a lot about um, and we're very happy working with one in a lab. Um, and what we can do is we, the E. coli will express the enzymes that are in those vectors. So some, a lot of these vectors are just going to have rubbish in there, but some of them have genes and some of them will have genes to express enzymes that we're interested in. Um, but at this stage, we don't know what we've got. So we just take all the ones that have got vectors and we kind of compile them into more of these deep well plates. Um, and we can use them to screen them as before using one of these sort of spotting hairbrush style things. Um, and we can then screen a lot of these different types of um, E. coli to look for particular enzymes. Um, next slide, please. So, at Aberystwyth, we've now got um, over 250 isolates, which we've got there, um, which are showing that they've got some kind of enzymes, which have got some activity um, for some, some um, compound that we want to break down. Um, and we've got some which are sequenced, we've got nine that are sequenced. Um, and then on the clone side of things, we've got over 30,000 clones, which are ready for screening. Um, and in the postdoc study, then we, we've managed to find that we did have some lyases, which are enzymes which are able to break down the main polymer in the green seaweed. Um, and we also found some lipases that are in there, um, I'm afraid. This is the kind of thing where there's not very many exciting pictures, so um, that's, you, that's about as good as it gets, I'm afraid. Um, next slide, please. So uh, just to, to finish, um, having, having done that, what I, what I want to say for regarding future plans is actually starting off with a confession. Um, that I have let uh, my sort of work on the North Ronald Say sheep sort of slide quite a lot in the last few years. But being asked to give this talk has really got me back into um, the data and thinking about these sheep again. And it's really been very inspiring putting this talk together. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is actually go back um, and revisit my data. Um, I've written a student project, so um, I'm hopefully going to get a student next year who can look at the library a bit more that we've created and screen those clones more because there's so much more information there than, than we found so far. Um, so yes, that's, that's my plans. So basically I want to say thank you for inspiring me to, to, to look into this data again. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Well, while you've been speaking, the questions have been coming in. Questions that, in fact, with this first one is certainly for all of you. Um, Shan, Katerina, Jessica and Louisa. Wendy Barry from Aberdour in Fife goes right to the key point and says the flavours of these heritage sheep are amazing. And I quote, the magic combination of breed, feed and age. And you can guess what the question is. Have you all tasted them? Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I haven't. No. <laughs> no. So Louisa hasn't, but what about Jessica? Uh, yes, I have. Um, so I went back up to Orkney um, the year after I did this work. Um, I actually came to the um, Orkney Science Festival, which was quite nice. Um, 
sort of in person. But yes, I went to North Rome Lassay and I had some up there. Very nice. How would, how would you describe the flavour of North Ronaldsay sheep to somebody who hadn't eaten them before and was just used to the, the standard breeds of mutton? Sean, I'm going to let you do that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think it's it's a lot leaner. So I guess with normal lamb or mutton, it's a bit fattier. Um, but the, the sheep here are very lean um, because of their diet and because um, having to live on the shore, I suppose, you know, it's a lot more exposed and they're having to work harder to... Um, to find their food from the sea. Uh, so I'd say it's a bit, you know, gamier as well. A little bit of a, like a sharper taste, would that would that be possibly the yeah, iodine? Yeah, I think so. Mm. Or something, something in the seaweed? Yeah, perhaps it is those sort of seaweed, um, I don't know if they're tannins or, or whatever's in the seaweed coming through. Katerina, have you had an opportunity to, to sample that delicious meat? No, I didn't have this opportunity, but I look forward after all <laughs> these uh, talks and discussions. So I will try as soon as possible to yeah. taste that. Well, there's another question that's come in this time. It's about the size of the animals, possibly more for Shan, but we'll see. It's Are all these ancient breeds, older breeds, tending to be fairly small compared to the more recent ones? Yeah, that's right. I think... Um... The Northern short tail group are all, uh, much smaller sheep than those that came uh, up through Europe. Um, and are they made, are they built or the, the lifestyle is more about burning up their food in, in, in energy rather than just standing in a field contentedly chewing grass? Yes, perhaps so. I think, um, yeah, they're much more energetic than, you know, the sheep, the big white sheep that you'd see in a field, you know, down south. Um, they're always kind of running and jumping and seem to be, I don't know, having fun by the looks to me. But We've a, a question about really food energy and food strategy from Peter Titley, who's got a conservation holding in Staffordshire where he's been looking after North Ronaldsea sheep for 40 years. He says they don't have seaweed there in the diet, but there's plenty of commitment. And his question is generally, could the UK, could Europe be doing more to encourage indigenous sources of protein rather than too much reliance on imported soya? Katerina? Yeah, yeah Howie, that's a great question. I think the last year we can see that um, European Union support a lot of research towards um, alternative feed sources for the animals. And as you say, the main reason is we would like to focus on more uh, local and uh, sustainable sources and try to reduce the, um, uh, the percentage of soya in the diet. So yes, it's, uh, it, it is promising. Uh, of course, soya, as I said earlier, is the king of the protein. Farmers use it now uh, for for many years they they used to that so so let's see how that will goes but there are of, there are of course a lot of options to uh, replace at least partially soya in the diet of the animals. And Richard Oakley in Murray is asking about figures and percentages. He said it's been you've been describing well all of you really the reduction in the greenhouse gases emitted if there's seaweed in the diet, what kind of figures are involved? Um, if I can say just came in my mind. So if we talk especially about the red seaweed as asparagopsis, they say, for example, if you introduce one or 2% dry matter basis as supplement in the diet, um, uh, trials have so up to 70% reduction of methane emissions uh, by the ruminants. Um, but of course, just to highlight that the, the, the percentage of the um, seaweed in the diet, it might uh, depend on the species, on the composition, on the content of the, of the tannins. So we always need to analyze the seaweed before we add it in the diet of the animals. But as you see, 70% is quite high and quite promising. Luisa, I, I think you wanted to come in. Uh, no, no, no. I, the, the few statistics that I know are pretty much what Katerina was, was describing and is very species dependent sometimes and seaweed dependent, yeah. 
what kind of look could we almost come to a global figure because there's a lot of sheep and cattle grazing in the world and putting out a lot of methane. Is there a possibility that with a really big shift towards some seaweed in the diet for them all, we could actually see a bit of a difference, maybe a slight difference, but a bit of a difference in the overall discharge of greenhouse gases? Yeah, yeah, I think it's possible because if we think like like 20 or 18 percent um, of greenhouse gas responsible is agriculture is responsible. Yes, there is a potential, uh, but of course we always need to be conscious that um, we want to 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 reduce the environmental pollution, but at the same time we don't want to reduce the animal performance and have any animal health issues. So it should be a kind of balance. We should keep that in mind. There's a question which I think may be for Jessica, and it's about the whole process of breaking down proteins with enzymes. The question is, is there a stage at which you could create a kind of soup of, of enzymes and acids, a kind mm -hmm. of process flow that actually mimics what's going on in the digestive tract of the North Ronaldsea sheep? Well, there are um, a lot of enzymes which are very specific. Um, so when you have quite a complicated large molecule, you quite often need, I don't know, seven or eight sort of different enzymes to, to sort of break different bonds within, within the structure. Um, so I would say that um, it's not, that, that's what a lot of the enzyme companies are working towards where you have this, this mix of a numerous enzymes. I mean, like Louisa was saying with the, um, the LPMO, uh, M, oh, sorry, <laughs> that um, by having that, by having exocellulases, endocellulases, um, maybe some amylases in there as well, you're able to break um, a lot more of that molecule up. Um, and it's the same with proteins. Um, sorry, going back to the original question. So, um, but yes, that's definitely where um, all the industry is going is looking at mixes, blends of enzymes, which are able to work more efficiently um, than just one on its own. And yeah, there's a, a sorry, carry on. Uh, this is what uh, the enzymatic cocktails try to do. There are two problems. These enzymes over a period of time can go off. In an organism, they will become constantly replaced and reproduced again. Instead, in an enzymatic cocktail, once they are dead, you need to replace the cocktail. The other problem is, is that for many aspects, we don't fully understand the interplay that happens in an organism between all of these enzymes. And therefore, it becomes very difficult to have something that is effective and cost efficient. So that's, that's where the challenges are. There's a comment come in on Facebook. Pauline on Facebook says you can buy two types of seaweed in one of the local supermarkets in Ireland, carrageen and dillisk. The latter can be roasted, then sprinkled over pasta, pizza, etc. Is that something one of you or more of you can give us more information about the, the availability of these products? Yeah. Uh... No, as far as I know, it's a, it's a good point because I know that uh, you can green the seaweed, you can use like a herbs. Uh, also, I have heard that some people, they used to eat uh, a pesto pasta, but the pesto contains seaweed, not really uh, basilic. So it's true, there are a lot of products for human consumption out uh, in the market nowadays. And if, if I can add to that, I would say that there's a lot of companies, UK companies, um, who've started up in the last 10 years who are producing seaweed that people can use for cooking. Um, and that in, in Ireland, they're, they're quite a long way ahead of us on this, I feel. Um, but I, I, just, I think the benefits of having seaweed in a diet is not, it's, it's, it's good for sheep, but it's also good for humans. Um, and that maybe we wouldn't be eating it in exclusivity, but what by inclu including it in your diet, you're actually getting a lot of vitamins and minerals and, and things like that. And in within the science festival, you've got different foraging trips. And um, I think you've maybe got some chefs who are cooking with seaweed possibly um, later on. Um, so it, it, if people are interested in that, I think it'd be, it's worth, worth exploring because um, it's great. Um, and I would also say that fresh seaweed is probably the best, but you can buy dried, chopped up seaweed from a number of places now and you can include it with 
pretty much any dish, you know, pastas, eggs, fish, particularly. Thank you. <laughs> We've got some appetizing recipes in um, for viewers on our website on the in the program tomorrow evening in the hoy and rackwick evening there's a very nice recipe for lentil and seaweed soup and in the meantime there's a question that's just come in for sean and it's really to do with your role as sheik dyke warden because it's something like 13 miles of stone wall around the island keeping the, the sheep on the shore and the questioner says if there are problems if the wall deteriorates if it can't be maintained what would happen to the sheep um, yeah, I hope we don't get to that point where <laughs> the, the wall is irreparable. Um, as it stands, there's quite a bit of fencing where parts of the wall are missing. And um, so that is a, a short term fix. Um, and I hope, you know, over the next two and a bit years that I can make a good go at uh, repairing the rest. <laughs> the damage some of the damage is on the surface and there's a tradition of rebuilding, but some of the damage is more structural from winter storms. Yeah, I think one of the problems is uh, on sandier parts of the island, the sheep tend to run uh, along right next to the dike, which cause a bit, uh, causes a bit of erosion and um, for then the foundations of the dike to, um, to fall in. So yeah, there are, um, there are easier bits of the dike to repair and th uh, parts that need a bit more thought. And another question has come in from someone who's clearly enthused both by the idea of working out in the, the sea air in North Ronald Sea and the flavour of the sheep, and is asking, is this something that, whether now or in the future, there's scope for volunteers? Yeah, unfortunately this year, um, we've obviously had to put off uh, volunteers because of the pandemic situation, but um, before that all came about, I did have quite a few, a few volunteers signed up uh, for this year. So I'm hoping that you know, that's something that I can revisit next year. Question has come in from Jane Cooper, who looks after Borrowray sheep. She's asking about tannins from trees, and she's wondering, could it be that they could reduce biogenic methane in ruminants? She says she feeds leafy branches to her sheep for other reasons, but would that in addition help with methane? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Actually, in uh, in my research group, uh, we have a couple of projects working on uh, willow. So willow is a tree that we found here in Northern Ireland, N not only, but here we can use it in Northern Ireland, especially for biofuel purposes. Uh, and the, and uh, it contains also bioactive compounds called uh, content stannins. And yes, uh, by using that in the diets can reduce both ammonia and methane emissions. So this is um, one of the alternative feeds that we should look um, uh, towards in, to introduce in the diet of the animals. Another question's come in about the availability of these ideas. How close or how far are we from a situation when it becomes standard agricultural practice to incorporate a certain percentage of seaweed in the diet of cattle and sheep? I would say this is quite a difficult question um, because um, if you have a small amount of seaweed in the diet, then it has a lot of benefits, if, particularly if any animal is def um, has any deficiencies because um, it's got all the vitamins and, and the, particularly the minerals and the elements in there. But depending where it's come from, if you've got a lot of brown seaweeds in there, then some of the um, other compounds in the brown seaweed can actually inhibit fat uptake. So it's one of the reasons that people, humans are interested potentially in including more seaweed in their diet because it could help people to either lose weight or not put on weight so much. But if you're looking at, you know, cattle and sheep where you actually are interested in increasing the amount of meat that's there, um, that's, it's, it's, it's contradictory. So I think you've got to be going back to what Katerina was saying, you have to be selective about which species of seaweed you're using um, or spe species, plural, um, rather than just sort of all seaweeds. Um, it's got to be a, a balance. Another question's come in from a listener that I suspect lives near the shore and asks, is there a potential seaweed growth, a potential growth in a seaweed industry right round the UK shores that, that you could anticipate? I, 
I would definitely. Um, I mean, there's there's a number of companies. Uh, so in, in Wales, um, we've had a lot of interest about people who want to start up companies in the last few years. There's um, companies down in Cornwall, the Cornish Seaweed Company, which they started off doing wild harvesting. Now they're cultivating. Um, the same is happening in Scotland. There's a number of companies up in Scotland which have been going for a number of years and everyone is looking to increase to expand. Um, they're talking about putting um, seaweed farms on um, off East Anglia now. Um, there's, they are, they're, they're, going to, they're going to become more common um, and I think seaweed's going to become a bigger thing in, in the UK in the future. And which, which seaweeds is that? Is it the, the deeper water ones like kelp? It's, yeah, people are mostly growing the big brown seaweeds initially because um, they are, you, you, well, the other thing about them is you can't cultivate them on land. So some of the, the smaller ones you can cultivate in, in tanks on land, but the bigger ones you need the tidal movement to do that. Um, but particularly in Wales, where we have um, a historical interest in a red seaweed called porphyra, which we also call lava, then there's a lot of people looking at trying to be growing lava because um, then we, we have a we have a ready market for it if we could grow it. So oh, is that the, the famous bread? Yes, lava bread. That's the one. <laughs> and one more question, and it's really for each of you. It's what are the next steps in the the research that you see or the research that that you're doing? Um, yeah, if I can. Oh, sorry, Katerina. Yeah, you, come in. Yes. No, no, just just two things. So, I think. Um, as Jessica said, first of all, we need to investigate um, the most appropriate species yeah, to feed the animals and uh, try to find out the specific dose that this seaweed will be uh, will provide the benefits if we feed it to the animals. The other thing is that we need to think about the issues around the seaweed and find solutions on that. For example, uh, some of them, they have high heavy metal, like, uh, like arsenic, for example, or high iodine content, which might cause issues uh, to the animals. So we need to find a solution to that. And also, from my opinion, to investigate different, probably conservation methods, like um, the best way that we can use seaweed for the animals, like on dry seaweed or silage, or, you know, uh, that might be another problem. That need to be solved. And Louisa, you were going to come in. For me, uh, I, I think I'm a little bit on the on the edge of, uh, of the, what we're talking about. So for me, my my interest is in general in uh, in how enzymes work, uh, and I see a lot of potential in understanding how enzymes work to do their job, so we can use it. Uh, and there is a lot of potential coming out recently in enzyme that degrade plastic. Uh, enzymes that degrade seaweed and more enzymes that degrade cellulose. So I think that there is a lot of untapped potential that nature gives us. Uh, and uh, if we can understand how it works, then, then we can make use of it. And Jessica? Um, well, uh, as I, I said at the end of my talk, I mean, even just going back, in, back to looking at some of my data is, is actually very good for me. Um, I think this this library that I have with these genes in it, I mean, there's so much potential in there for so many, so many different enzymes to, to find them, to characterize them, um, and then um, to, to look at whether they could be used in combination with other enzymes that are there to actually be able to break down some of these um, seaweed polymers. Uh, that's my, my direction that I would go in. We will be looking forward to keeping in touch and hearing from all of you about the, the progress of your, your research. Just before rounding off, I should say that in an hour's time, at three o'clock, we'll be going back to North Ronaldsey, taking a look at the general question of resources on the shore, the benefits from the sheep like wool, and this deep question, the challenge of ocean plastic. Could even ocean plastic be turned into a resource? That's at three o'clock this afternoon, giving a, an hour for a tea break or even a, a late lunch. And I'd like to round off by thanking all four of you, Sean, Katerina, Louisa, and Jessica. And to everyone, thank you for listening. Thank you.